Quantum mechanics is probably the strangest theory that has ever been developed by mankind. You have particles that act like waves, and then you have waves that act like particles. So, the question is, how do we develop an intuitive understanding of quantum mechanics? Well, the answer is that you use quantum mechanics. And what do I exactly mean by that? Well, in order to understand quantum mechanics, you have to use what's called a quantum computer, or at least you can, in theory. Now, what is a quantum computer? That is a question that we will be exploring over the course of our journey. Now, the first step in our journey begins right here at UCL at the office of our very own Dr. Dan Brown. What makes a quantum computer different from a normal computer? So that's, that question really gets at the, the heart of what, what a quantum computer is. And really a quantum computer is a computer that's based on quantum mechanics where the information is represented quantum mechanically and it's also processed quantum mechanically. So what does that, what does that mean, quantum mechanically? So I guess you, you might have heard of a wave particle duality. Um, one of the, the early discoveries in the development of quantum mechanics, which really was a breakthrough in, in physics at the beginning of the 20th century, was that things that we thought of as particles, like atoms or electrons, um, behaved sometimes like waves and things that we thought of as waves such as light sometimes behaved like particles and quantum mechanics was the theory that was developed to explain these concepts and put them on a on a firm mathematical footing so we could start to understand and predict this behavior so a quantum a quantum computer is a computer where the information is is stored in a in a quantum system and you can think of information um, in terms of bits, binary digits, zeros and ones. That's how we store information in our computers. It's how this, this video will be being recorded and stored on the, on the memory inside the camera. And a zero and a one is, is a very simple, simple object, simple concept. It has just two states, zero and one. Uh, in a quantum computer, we would um, want to represent the information using quantum bits. And quantum bits are bits which behave quantum mechanically. And in particular, they um, allow us to prepare states which are in superposition of zero and one. Now, superposition is a, is a wave-like property. It's really, loosely speaking, it's um, when two waves of different properties come together and combine. And, and we, we see this all the time. If you ever sort of splash around in a, in a swimming pool, you can, you can create lots of waves and you, you see how they, they um, combine and they can cancel each other out. And um, the, what quantum computing does is it um, allows us to represent data in a way that we can have superposition between different logical states, different values of zeros and ones and this wave-like interference can also have cancellations and also it can have reinforcements. Um, it's a property that we call quantum interference and it means that quantum information can be processed in a, in a fundamentally different way to, to classical information. What do you need to have a quantum computer in theory? What are the key components? Yeah, this, this, this was a question which um, really occupied people when, when quantum computers were first proposed. So the early ideas for quantum computers came from uh, Richard, Richard Feynman, who was, was thinking about the, the, the practical problem that many physicists faced um, at the time in the early 1980s when, when computer technology was really becoming very important in physics, we were using computers more and more to simulate quantum systems. And it's difficult. It's, it's very difficult to simulate a quantum mechanical system on a standard classical computer. And that's because the, the description of the quantum system um, grows very rapidly um, with the number of particles that you wish to simulate. And often, in physics, we might be interested in simulating the properties of, say, say a solid object. So a solid object like, like this table, you know, this contains billions upon billions of, of particles. Any simulation which, which tries to understand uh, the properties of a, of a complex system like, you know, like, a, like a piece of solid needs to somehow simulate many, many particles at once. 
And so Richard Feynman, realizing that this was this was hard to do, he proposed turning turning things on 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 its turning the question on its head. Really, if um, quantum systems are hard to simulate on a classical computer, maybe using quantum mechanics in a computer would give it additional computational power. So what do quantum computers need? Well, they need um, what needs to be able to store information in a way that its quantum properties are preserved. So the quantum properties of superposition that I described can be very delicate and quantum systems um, often interact with their, um, their surroundings. And these interactions really, you know, this, this, these, these interactions represent the, the fundamental physics of particles and uh, waves that we, that we like to study. But if we're using quantum systems to store information, those interactions can, can lead to errors. Uh, then we also need a way to manipulate the um, data. So in a classical computer, we manipulate bits using logic gates. So logic gates transform uh, the state, one state set of bits into another set of bits, and that's the, the basic building block that all computer programs are, are built out of. Um, in a quantum computer, we would do something an an analogous and use quantum logic gates which um, preserve and create properties such as superposition. And so a second requirement for a quantum computer is you need a quantum logic gate. Uh, the third key element of a quantum computer is measurement. We need to be able to read out the, the quantum data once we've processed it. So that is a, another key element. It's, it's quite hard to balance those things because to, in order to measure a quantum system, you need to have a very strong interaction with it. But on the same time, at the same time, um, we're trying to protect our quantum data from unwanted interactions with the outside world. So designs for quantum computers try and balance those two properties. Is this property, this balancing, is it, is it what coherence is? So, so coherence is the, the preservation of superposition. It's, it's the preservation of the wave-like property. It's really, really a, a more formal term for, for the wave-like properties that quantum systems can, can have. And that, that, that property is one of the first things that goes away when a quantum system has a, an uncontrolled interaction with, um, uh, with, with its environment. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, quantum computers uh, probably will be used to simulate solids. Yes. Are there any other particular fields in which quantum computers will be much more efficient than classical computers? Or are quantum computers better in any field compared to classical computers? So the, the sorts of problems which a quantum computer would, would have an advantage over classical computers are, 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 um, are problems which really can exploit the, the quantum properties in a quantum computer, and and a quantum computer is not a an all-purpose machine that will be faster than classical computers for all problems. Um, one one class of problems that you've you've already identified, simulating solid solid systems. We imagine quantum computers would be very valuable. Um, there's also it's also been proposed that quantum computers may help in in chemistry, where the quantum mechanics in the interaction between between particles in and between molecules in, in chemistry is also something that's hard to simulate on a classical computer. So that's an area of active research using quantum computing in um, chemistry. There's also, um, um, that, so there is, uh, there are some contexts in which a quantum computer could be useful for um, generic, for general problems. And uh, one example of this is Grover's algorithm which is an algorithm for speeding up um, an unstructured search. So if you're searching through data for a particular property, um, using a quantum computer may have some advantages. So you may be able to speed up those kind of search, um, those kind of searches, and that often comes up in many, many kinds of problems. Um, we, we know that quantum computers have efficient algorithms for uh, factoring large numbers, that's a problem which has been studied in mathematics for, 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 for centuries, and, and no one has ever found an efficient algorithm to, 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 to solve that problem. I also heard that uh, quantum entanglement, the, the entanglement of two quantum particles, can be used in quantum computers. How is it possible? 
So quantum entanglement is a fascinating topic in its own right. It's it's an intrinsically quantum property which doesn't have any analogues in the classical world, which makes it quite hard to, to explain what it is. Um, it's what arises naturally when we take this principle of, of superposition, this wave-like property, and we allow it to um, what well, we, we allow it to um, be introduced into systems with, with more than one particle. So um, superposition was this, this idea that we can have um, a system can be, uh, in a sense, in two, two states at the same time in, in, in the same way that waves can add together. A sort of a, a water wave can have um, within it multiple waves and they all interact and they all add up together. Um, so that principle, when it's extended to quantum systems of, of multiple particles, gives you automatically entanglement. So what, what are the consequences of entanglement? Well, one of the consequences is that the, the overall state of all of the systems together can no longer be described in terms of its, the, the, the individual states of the individual particles. And that's, you know, that's one of the, the basic concepts of, of classical physics, that when we describe a system of many particles, we can just always build it up from the individual states of the individual particles. When we have entangled states in quantum mechanics, however, that's no longer the case. Now, entanglement is very important in quantum computing because we, we know that if we have a quantum computer uh, which doesn't generate any entanglement, we know that um, this, this computer um, is likely to, to have no computational advantage compared to um, a, a classical computer. Um, we, we therefore know that um, generating entanglement in a quantum computer is going to be, be necessary for their successful operation and therefore it becomes a, a very important part of building a quantum computer is demonstrating that you can um, create entanglement in a controlled way and, and demonstrate that it's there. I've heard about uh, an American company, uh, D-Wave, ah, yes. that they have created uh, a quantum computer. Yes. Is it a true, real, universal quantum computer that they've created? So first to correct you, D-Wave is a Canadian company. They're based, oh, in, they're based in Vancouver, just north of, <laughs> north of the border. Um, so so the, the, the model of quantum computing that I've talked about so far is, is something that we call the quantum gate model. So where we, we um, are um, trying to realize analogues of the, the logic gates in um, classical computing. And it is in this gate model that we have algorithms, for example, for factoring large numbers. Now, what um, D-Wave has really, really pioneered, both in terms of um, the really advocating a particular uh, computational model and actually building devices in this model is, is, a, is, a, is a slightly different model and um, practitioners in this area give it a different name to distinguish it from the standard quantum computing paradigm. So we call it quantum annealing. So what D-Wave's um, model of quantum computing, quantum annealing does, is it encodes the, the answer to a computational problem in the properties of the, the lowest energy state of a system of many qubits. And, and really their model, it's, it's, it's simulating a model of, of magnetism actually. So each of their qubits you can think of as, as representing uh, individual magnets and they pose their, their, their computational problem uh, by simulating interactions between these magnets. So you can imagine all magnets uh, interacting with each other and when you put two magnets together often they want to align with each other. You can also set up magnets so that they preferentially want to anti-align, have, have the opposite direction. And if you imagine a complicated system of magnets all interacting, some of them wanting to align, some of them wanting to anti-align, that system will be in its lowest energy state when as many as possible of these pairs uh, are aligned or anti-aligned the way the, the magnet wants to go. And that's the way problems are represented in the D-Wave machine. And they use an analog of annealing um, to try and get the system down to its lowest state. Um, and what, once, once their um, system is in its lowest state, they read off the, the answer and that represents the output of their computation. So the D-Wave machine is built on qubits, um, like a standard quantum computer. And um, the, the, the key difference 
is that instead of um, applying logic gates one by one, um, where you need very much, you always need to try and maintain the coherence of your qubits as you apply more and more, more logic gates. The hope is that with this, this annealing approach, um, the, the, the need to um, pr protect the coherence is, is less, less strong. And this has allowed D-Wave to um, build, build chips with um, you know, hundreds and now thousands of, of quantum bits um, and demonstrate the, um, the quantum annealing algorithms. And they've been able to show, show that these annealing algorithms work and that they, they give you um, the, the answer to, to certain uh, computational problems. And it's, it's a completely different, different paradigm to the standard picture of quantum computing. So really, the two, the two models um, go side by side. They're really different, different approaches to um, computing, both trying to use quantum mechanics in a, in a different way to gain some advantage over, over classical computing. What would be your guess? When will you have the first universal quantum computer? Well, I mean, so, so that in a sense, we already have um, universal quantum computers. There uh, already, they're, they're, there are small demonstrations of, of universal quantum computers with a small number of bits. For example, I, IBM, the research group at IBM, have, have created a quantum computer on a chip with, with five qubits. And they've actually um, connected this quantum computer to an online interface. And anyone, any member of the public or any researcher can log in and actually run uh, computations on this, um, this chip. And it's a, so it's a small demonstration, it's only five qubits. And you know, there's nothing you can run on a five qubit machine that you couldn't compute on a, on a standard desktop machine. Nevertheless, that's a very, very important milestone to have a, a publicly, publicly accessible um, quantum computer. And it is a universal quantum computer, it's just a very small one. So the big question is, um, how can we scale these ideas up to larger machines, which are still well enough controlled so that the noise levels are sufficiently under control that we can correct any errors that the noise generates? And that's uh, currently a big open research problem that a lot of energy is being, being put into. If the computer on your desk would be a universal quantum computer, and it would have not five, but 32 or mm -hmm. 64 or 128 bits yes. in it, what would you do with it? So the most, Im the, the first thing you would try and do, particularly with a, with a quantum computer with say 50 uh, quantum bits, would be try and demonstrate a computation which would be beyond the reach of a uh, classical computer. And the numbers of qubits, when you would get up to about 40 or 50 quantum bits, then you're really in a, in a regime where there, there are certain computations which a, a classical computer would, with, with current technology would really struggle to compute. So the, the first thing you would try and do is to find some problem or, or some other um, experiment which would demonstrate that the, the quantum computer was doing something that no uh, classical computer could realize. And this could even be posed as a, as a challenge problem, perhaps, that you could, you could um, publish the problem that you're trying to solve Maybe, maybe keep the output of your um, computation secret and challenge the world to, to use classical computer technology to, um, to beat it. So that, that will be a very important milestone when we um, are able to, to demonstrate beyond, beyond doubt convincingly that quantum computers have been able to perform computations that are impossible on a classical computer. Now, these early computations may not necessarily be useful for anything. There'll, there'll be problems that have maybe been designed for the purpose of, of challenging classical computers. So um, they would be, be demonstration experiments, but nevertheless, they would be very, very important um, confirmation of, of the potential of a quantum computer to outperform classical.